We're going to do a lot of Bible reading. First of all, we're going to start from, to read from the book of Genesis chapter 50, verse 24 to 26. And then we're going to move over to the next chapter, which is Exodus chapter 1, from verse 1 to 22. Hallelujah. I'll read it. Genesis chapter 50, verse 24 to 26. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised you on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up from this place. Please bear that in mind. And Joseph made his Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up from this place. We'll move on to verse 26. So Joseph died at the age of 110. And after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Hallelujah. Amen. We'll move on to Exodus chapter 1. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Verse 6. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. Bear that in mind. But the Israelites were exceeding fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in number, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal with shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pitom and Ramesses as store city for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiply. Yes. The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields and all the harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shepra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill it. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt took matters into his own hands. He summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Okay. When you have li why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. I'm talking to people who never compromise who they are. For what their enemy was. They are vigorous and give birth to midwives that are okay. So God was kind to the midwives. Why? Because they feared. 
and the people increased, they became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them their families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew, every, every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Now we're just going to move on to the next scripture reading, which is Exodus chapter 2, 23 to 25. The Bible says, during that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham with Isaac and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and he was concerned about them. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, God remember. God remember. Mankind can forget. Mankind can forget. But God remember. But God look at your neighbor and say, God has remembered you today. God has remembered you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Our last scripture. Philippians, Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. It reads as follows. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which trans transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If you can read in, the, in this verse, the Bible says that um, don't be anxious about anything. But every situation, give requests to God. And the Bible says that um, the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guide your heart and your mind. It doesn't say that and God will rescue you out of, out of your trouble. It says, whatever that you are going through, wherever you are right now, God says, by prayer and petitions and thanksgiving, make your request to Him. And his peace will come down. It, it doesn't say, and he will rescue you out of your situation. Alright? And his peace will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And let's close our eyes and open in prayer. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. I pray today, Father God, that let it be you who is revealed. Let it be you who is glorified. Let it be you that the people receive. Because we understand that when you are on our side, no one can be against us. I humble myself before you, Lord, and I say that let it be you who is exalted. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The human mind is very interesting. Your brain, your mind is interesting because it becomes a power source of whatever that happens around you. When I go to that switch and I switch on the light, the light will become the manifestation of the action that I just did. So when the light comes on, you can see that the light has come on. Maybe I went there and I switched on the switch and sat down quickly. You are able to realize the manifestation of the light. And then if you look who switched on the light, you can't even tell who switched on the light. I mean, I sat down quickly. You couldn't even realize it. Okay. So the switch now becomes the power source. 
I cause an action to the light, and a reaction comes into place. When you are a short-tempered individual, your, sh your short-temperedness becomes a reaction to the action of anger that is happening in your mind. When you're a person who's always depressed and who's always keeping himself or herself in a bed, you being in the bed and being depressed is a reaction to the action of hurt that is happening in your mind. Therefore, whatever you meditate upon, your body reacts in accordance to what you're meditating upon. Hallelujah. Now, a man's character is a combination of all of his thoughts. Who you are is a result of what is happening in here. How you react around people is a result of what is happening in here. Your character, the way it is, is a result of what is happening in your mind. Hallelujah. So, the enemy understands the state. He understands that when he comes to you and taints your mind, he will automatically taint your character. When he comes to you and manipulates your mind, he automatically manipulates your character. That is why they say that the mind is a battlefield. The mind is the war zone of the enemy. Because he understands that when he attacks you on that level, everything around you will react to the attack that happened in your mind. The Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Allow me to say, out of the abundance of your mind, your character speaks. Out of the abundance of your thoughts and your ideology, your character will speak. Now, in the Bible, we are reading a very interesting story about the Israelites. Okay? But before I touched on them, in as much as I've explained how the mind operates when it comes to who you are and your environment, in as much as the willpower can become powerful, in as much as your own mind is uh, powerful, I want you to realize that it has a limitation. Your mind can take you to places, yes, but it can limit you as well. All right? So, when you depend on your own psychology, you will read your own psychology's results. When you depend on your own intellect, you will read your own intellect's results. When you depend on your own understanding, you will reap your own understanding's results. That is why God comes in the Bible and says, Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Your own mind can produce your own type of character. But when, the, when your character is messed up, when your mind is messed up, God wants you to come into his presence and inherit his mind. So that he can breed a certain type of character that will make you worthy to step into your promised land. Yes, sir. Because our own works and our own minds and our own ideologies, our characters will never take us to where God wants us to be. But you understand that it is when you are lost in God that you find yourself. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Now I can move on to the Israelites' oppression. The Bible says that the Israelites were being oppressed. Okay? And this is happening after the death of Joseph. Joseph died. His brothers died. The Bible says that even the whole of his generation died. So the, the, the generation that was oppressed 
in the book of Exodus chapter 1 is the generation that started when they were young and they started producing. All right. So in the midst of them being oppressed, in the midst of them being heartbroken, and in the midst of them being beaten up by the Egyptians, the Bible says that they cried out unto the Lord. They cried out unto the Lord. Hallelujah. They cried out unto the Lord. For 430 years, the Hebrews have been tormented by the Egyptians. For 430 years, the, e the Hebrews knew Kuri, they cannot grow beyond where they are. Because whatever that they look upon is their environment and the situation that is happening. When Joseph and his generation died, the vision died with them. The Israelites are now oppressed. They are lashed. They are beaten up. They are oppressed. And the more they, the more they oppress them, the more they multiply in number. The number becomes a threat to the Egyptian king. And they oppress them all the more. The more they oppress them, the more they multiply in number. Now, I want to talk to the type of people who came today, who feel oppressed, who feel beaten down by the situations that are around them. You feel crushed and crushed and crushed. But in the midst of that crushing, there is a multiplication that is happening inside of you. In the midst of that breaking down, there is something that is pulling out of you. The more you break, the more you are oppressed, the more there is something that comes out of you. A multiplication is just taking place. And multiplication is just increasing because your situations are bringing you down. And I understand that wherever you are, probably when you're in your room, you're crying out to the Lord saying, Father, what am I going to eat tomorrow? Father, what are my kids going to eat tomorrow? Father, I understand that now there is pressure of the exams. But I understand at the same time that you are doing something and pulling something out of me. In the midst of you being crushed, in the midst of you being oppressed, I want you to tell you that God remembers you. God remembers you. God remembers you. So we are seeing the Israelites, they are being oppressed. The environment has defined them. They themselves feel, oh, you know what, I guess it's just going to take another 400 years. It's, it's been 430 years that I've been in slavery. It's been 430 years that even my grandfather was in slavery. So if he died in slavery, probably me as his grandchild, I'm going to die in slavery. Because the vision has died with the forefathers. Now the Bible speaks about Moses. Moses goes to, Moses kills an Egyptian and he moves out. He runs away because he thinks that the Egyptians probably they know he, they killed one of he killed one of his own. The Bible says that as he ran away, there was a burning bush, and a voice came out from the bush saying, "Moses, Moses, come hither." The Bible says that when Moses was about to step into the presence of the Lord, God says, "Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place that you're standing on is holy ground." Moses in his mind does not understand why God is saying that. Moses in his mind does not understand why God is calling him into that place. It's his first encounter with the Lord. But God says, take off your sandals. In the mind of, of Moses, he does not understand. But in the mind of God, he understands that there's a vision that I'm about to drop in this man. Maybe your sandals 
is whatever that you are holding on that you know that you shouldn't be holding on. Maybe your sandals is the behavior and the habits that you are holding on that you are not supposed to hold on. Maybe your sandals is the attitude that is not of God that you are giving off that you are not supposed to give off. God says for me to speak to you, put everything aside. Now Moses steps into the presence of the Lord. God speaks to him. And he says, I have heard the cries of my people. Now it's time. I have remembered the oath that I've made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I want you to go to the elders of the Israelites and tell them that God is about to take you to the land that is overflowing with milk and honey. Moses moves out. He goes and speaks to the elders. A vision is now birthed into the Israelites. A vision is now birthed to those that had no hope. I want to tell you today that when you, as you are here and the vision about your life is not so clear, God is about to clarify it. I want to tell you today that as you step into this place, put aside whatever that is not of the Lord. Forget whatever that might hinder your focus. Forget, forget whatever that might hinder your connection to the Lord. God wants you to fully focus on Him because He's about to birth a vision in you. Probably God birthed a vision in you. But the vision is not so clear. God is saying, put aside whatever that is hindering your connection with me. Because I'm about to clarify your vision. He goes to the Israelites. Now the Israelites have something to hold on to. They have something to focus to. They have something that they can lean their minds to. That as long as I lift my eyes unto the hills, everything around me, I understand that it is just for a season. We see Moses now, he goes back into the presence of the Lord. The Bible, the Bible says that God speaks to Moses and says, what do you have in your hand? And Moses says, I have a staff. Please bear in mind, when God went to Moses and said, what do you have in your hand? God didn't say, Moses, I want you to go around and look for a staff. God didn't say, Moses, I want you to go to Aaron and borrow his staff. He says, what do you have in your hand? He says, I have a staff. Now, in the Bible, a staff and a rod, they are used interchangeably. All right? And when I was reading a certain article, it says that a staff and a rod, in the Hebrew term, they were sharing a certain particular name, which is a shebet. S-H-E-B-E-T. Okay? So, not the shebet, they are to hear. Okay? So, a staff and a rod were used interchangeably. Um, when they say the shepherd in Hebrew, probably when, I, when I'm a Hebrew person and I come to, to eat to, and he's also Hebrew, when I say shepherd, he's probably thinking of two things at the same time. Okay? So, so I want you to, to, to notice something, okay? That in the Bible, when it speaks about a shepherd and a, when it speaks about a rod and a staff, the Bible says that a rod and a staff, they were used for correction and discipline. Alright? When a sheep moves out of the way, a staff would be used to bring them closer to the way that is determined by the shepherd. Alright? 
So a staff was sort of like God, so, but it had a hook. So whenever a sheep is tending his flock and the sheep you know misbehavior and goes away, he takes a thing, he pulls it by the neck, brings it back to the pack and says, let's move forward. All right? And then, so a staff is used to bring wandering sheep into the line that is determined by the shepherd. Micah speaks about this thing. He prophesies about Jesus and he says, shepherd your people with your staff. The flock of your inheritance. Brings you back to the way. Now let me let me speak about the rod, okay? A rod was also a wooden stick, né? but it had a, something like this, okay? Something like this. Konopi. Okay, konopi. Yeah. So a, a rod was a stick, called it normally, but it has a big round, polish thing in ya. Alright. So, a rod in the Bible was used for defense and offense. Ne? So when they attack you, because you didn't have a weapon, probably guns didn't exist at that time. So when they approach you and they want to take you down, you would use your, your rod as a, as a weapon and retaliate with it. Okay. So, so a rod in as much as it's a weapon of defense and offense, it was also used as a walking stick to balance Kaiwan. Nah. And then also, moreover, a rod, a rod was, was, was used to instill discipline in people. Discipline. That is why the Bible says that he who spares a rod hates his son. Okay? But he who loves him is diligent enough to discipline him. I'm not promoting abuse. <laughs> okay. So now, we, we, we read also a story about a certain young man. His name is David. And David comes and he meets up with Saul. There's a Goliath that stood place in that place, okay? He came and then he's busy throwing tantrums to, 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 to the people. And everything. You know the story, alright? And David goes to, to Saul and he explains the function of a rod. Né? He says, whenever he would be keeping his father's sheep, né? a lion would come, take the sheep. Né? A lion or a bear would come, take the sheep. After taking the sheep, the Bible says that David would go after that lion, strike it with the rod, rescue the sheep out of the lion's mouth. Okay? So, just imagine the size of a rod. It's something round about this big. This tall. Okay? So, David used that to make sure that he disciplines whatever lion and whatever bear that comes after his father's sheep. Okay? Okay. But then, if you realize the story about David and him taking down whatever thing that would oppose him. He used the big thing to take care of the small thing. And he used the small thing to take care of the big thing. The size of a rod is this tall, but he used it to strike a lion. Okay? The size of a stone is this small, but he used it to take down a Goliath. So this makes me realize that sometimes it is not about what you depend on. It's about who you depend on. It was not the stuff that was able to change the water to be blood. But it was the God behind the stuff that made that happen. 
It was not the five fishes and the two loaves that multiplied themselves to become men or plenty. But it was the God behind those five loaves and two fishes. If you realize the story of Moses when God asked him, what do you have in your hand? And he says, a staff. It's kind of related to when God, when Jesus came and asked the, 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 the disciples, well, what do you guys have in your hands? God has given you a certain gift that might be different from His. God might have given you a certain gift that might be different from His. God might have, might have given you a certain talent. And God is saying, What do you have? What do you have in your hands? Probably the oppression around you is beating you down and God is just asking you a question. What do you have? Probably everything is not going the way you, you thought that they would go. But God is asking you a question. What do you have? Probably your parents are hating you. Probably you don't know what, what is it, what is the next step that you are supposed to do to move on to the next level. But God is asking you, what do you have? What do you have in your hand? What do you have? No matter how small it is, it will make you victorious. No matter how neglected, how, how people undermine it, it will make you victorious. Yes, we understand that the staff was used to make certain miracles in Egypt. Yes, we understand that the staff is not the promised land. But that which you have in your hands, God will use it. 